So how do we know that glaciers have reached that far? Well, there are several lines of evidence that scientists use to determine what the environment was like in the past. Now, currently, we have teams of scientists around the world, along with enthusiastic amateurs such as myself, that make regular temperature checks and monitor things like precipitation, weather patterns, ocean currents, things like this. All these kind of things that help us determine what the environment is like now and how it's changing as we move forward. Now, obviously 100,000 years ago there wasn't somebody stood there with, with a thermometer measuring the temperature. So how do scientists determine what the temperature and other environmental conditions were like in the past? Well, they use what's called proxy data. Now, proxy data doesn't mean that they're making stuff up. What proxy data means is that instead of a absolute reading, like you would do with a thermometer, of say 10.4 degrees, what you'd have is several lines of evidence that would indicate a temperature range between, say, 10.1 and 10.7. Okay. And then you'll be able to infer from that that the temperature was in that boundary period, that boundary area. And a proxy evidence do scientists use? Well, the first one I want to go over is what's called sedimentology and geomorphology. Now, this is basically what I've been doing in the past couple of videos. I've been going around parts of the Shropshire's landscape and showing various features like eskers and moraines, kettles and canes. And we can then compare these kind of landscapes to where glaciers currently exist on the planet. And from there we can infer what kind of environment there was during the past. Now, one of the features that you'll find where glaciers used to be is a sedimentary deposit called glacial till. Now, the difference, we, the reason why we know it was deposited by a glacier instead of a river is the different composition. Now, water laid sediments tends to be fairly well rounded as the constant flowing of water rounds the particles and it also tends to be very well graded. Now, what this means is you will end up with thick layers of heavier sediments at the bottom. So, sorry, you'll end up with layers of heavier particles at the bottom, and then you get a progressively lighter sediment up towards the top as the heaviest stones and sand tend to drop first. What you get in a glacial sediment, however, in glacial till, is a very poorly sorted sediment. Now, you'll end up with larger lumps of rock, larger boulders, small stones, all surrounded by a very uh, finely grained, but at the same time quite coarse, sandy matrix. This is a good indicator that you've, got, you've had previous glaciations in the past where you have this very well, on, very poorly sorted material, as both water and windblown sediments tends to be quite well organised. Besides glacial till, there are also other glacial related deposits. So there's glacial effluvial, which are sedimentary deposits laid down by meltwater rivers both in and around the glaciers, and glacial recoustrine deposits, which are glacial deposits based around meltwater lakes. And besides those, there are also some of the landscape features that are found in Shropshire, things like eskers, the kettles and canes, uh, moraines, and other, other features like that. And we can compare and contrast these kind of landscapes with where we find glaciers today. And it gives us a good indication of how far glaciers got to in the past, and what was happening within these glacial processes. Next we've got dendrochronology. Now many people are familiar with dendrochronology as a science. As a simple, as a simple overview, as a tree grows, it will add an extra ring each year. Now, during a year when the environmental conditions are favourable to the tree, you tend to get a thicker growth ring. If the environmental conditions are less favourable for the tree's growth, you tend to get a thinner growth ring. Now, when we compare that to living trees now, we know what the environmental conditions are favourable to things like oak and ash and birch. So when we find ancient oak, ash and birch, and we take samples from these trees, we can get a good idea of what the environmental conditions were like when that tree was alive. This is then cross-referenced with other pieces of evidence, things like pollen records, known historical dates, radiocarbon, records to give an accurate uh, date, to give an absolute date for a lot of the material. Other tree samples, and we'll take, they'll take tree samples from all over the world, and that will help to slowly over time build a picture of what the environment was like, not just in that little area, but also globally, and how 
the environment might actually be slightly different to, say, parts of North America as it is to Europe. So sticking with the plant theme, what we've got is put next is pollen records. Now I know the pollen records in the previous episodes, and what we can know is that where we find pollen for certain plants, those plants were growing and thriving in those areas. So we can find from sediment cores, and we can also find them trapped in glacial ice, which I'm going to get onto in a minute. And it's just a good indication, as under the microscope, pollen looks very different depending on what species of plants you're looking at. So it allows you to determine whether it was something like an oak or an ash tree, whether it was a whether it was a pine or a birch or grasses, moss, things like that. And next we've got marine sediment cores. These are formed from layers of mud that are deposited at the bottom of the sea. And then some of this mud comes from the land, some of it is precipitated down from material that's already in the oceans, and some of it is from things like dust that's blown off from the continents into the ocean, that then settles, eventually settles down onto the ocean floor, creating these thick layers of mud. It also includes the remains of dead organisms. Now, a key one is a particular type of microscopic organism called a Foraminifera. Now, Foraminifera are protist single cell organisms, kind of similar to an amoeba. Now, what they do is they form this little shell around themselves called a test, and this test is usually made out of calcium carbonate. And these little tests will look very different depending on the different species of the foraminifera that you've got. And similar in a way to things like pollen records, where we find certain species of foraminifera, we know that the environmental conditions would favour that particular species of foraminifera. That's assuming it's a species of foraminifera that is alive today. We can look at the shape of these organisms and determine what commonalities they have with foraminifera that are alive now. And help develop, and have, that helps our understanding of what the environmental conditions were like. Now, formulifera have been around since the Cambrian, and they've been used as a way of um, doing biostratigraphy to determine what layers are related to what age in a relatively in a relative dating sense. And they've been doing that since about the nineteen twenties, but more recently, with the development of modern, more modern technology, they've also been used to give an indication of the temperature. Now, what this relates to is oxygen isotope rate. Now, how they, this is done is using different, a ratio of the dis, two different isotopes of oxygen. Now, they've been doing this since about 2005. Now, the two key isotopes of oxygen they're looking for is oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. Oxygen 18 is slightly heavier than oxygen 16. Now, what this means is that it requires more energy to evaporate water contains oxygen 18 than does oxygen 16. So in a colder environment, you tend to find more oxygen 18 being used in the calcium carbonate of the shells of the foraminifera. So where we find this, we know that the environment is a lot colder. Now remember that because it's going to come up again in a second. Similar to marine sediment cores, we've also got ice cores. Now this follows a very uh, similar principle. We've also got the added advantage that within ice cores, you've got the different layers showing between winter snowfall and summer melt. And you can count these layers back, and you can go back several hundred thousand years within places like Greenland for, and Antarctica and stuff like that. And as the snow falls during, well, not just the winter, but particularly during the winter, what it does is it traps air bubbles within inside the ice. As it, as it falls down. These little air bubbles give you an indication of what the ancient atmosphere was like and they will include things like carbon dioxide layer levels, traces of pollen, traces of dust from things like volcanic activity, other gases like sulfur dioxide, ammonia and things like that and methane. And this gives you a good idea of what the environment was like, certainly from an atmospheric point of view, in the past. Now, the other advantage of this is we can then tell things like carbon dioxide levels and how they've fluctuated over time and we know and we've known from I think at least the 1930s that carbon dioxide absorbs heat and will aid in the warming of the atmosphere. One other thing we can tell from the air trapped in them but also the oxygen used within the ice itself is again the oxygen isotope the other levels. This one because it's been evaporated if you've got more oxygen 18 you've got a warmer environment less oxygen 18, 
in the in the ice crystals, you've got a cold environment because there has been the energy to evaporate it up into the atmosphere. Our well, final lines of proxy evidence is macroscopic fossils, and in particular, beetles. What, you thought I was going to say mammoths or something? Yeah, beetles are of particular importance, and it's not that surprising when you consider that there are about 400,000 known species of beetle on this planet right now. They make up close to a quarter of all known animal species. Just beetles, never mind any other kind of insects. A greater number of beetles within an ecosystem than you'll have large mammals like, say, mammoths. And besides just sheer number, and there being more beetles available within an ecosystem, there will be large mammals, you will also find that most beetles are very habitat specific. They will only live in a, specific, in a particular temperature range or humidity range. They'll only feed on a particular food source. So what this does is that, particularly when you go back to records during the Pleistocene, you will be able to get a good indication of what the local habitat was like should you find certain species of beetle particularly if they're closely related or are the same species of beetle that are alive today because their habitat range is that specific. That's not to say that larger animals and plants aren't useful for reconstructing past ecosystems, they, they really are. And one of the reasons why we knew that mammals survived up until 13,000 years ago within the British Isles are because of the evidence of the mammoths that we found in Condo the in Shropshire. They were the most recent ones at the time in Western Europe. And besides mammoths, there is also fossil evidence of creatures like wolverines, bison, hippopotamuses, wolves, deer, reindeer in particular. Now, most of these animals do point towards a cold environment. And if you think hippopot if you think of the hippopotamus is a warm creature, mm, now it is. But what it looks like happened is that the hippopotamus made its way northwards during the Wolstonian and stayed within Britain, at least during one of the re-advances. The proxy data for past climates gives us a good idea of what the environment was like during the Pleistocene. And what we can tell certainly during the Devensian is that Shropshire was on the boundary between the ice and the ice-free parts of the British Isles. So that's one of the reasons why there's quite a lot of landforms within Shropshire, things like the Eskers and the Kettles in the north part of the county. There was the ice coming in from the Irish Sea, that mounted up into Cheshire and went across the Cheshire Plain into, into northern Shropshire. We also got the ice coming from the Welsh Valleys down, down into the county as well and coming further south from central Wales via Herefordshire into Shropshire. So all this collectively gives a good idea of what the environment was like within the county during the Pleistocene, certainly during the Devensian at least. Now these boundaries led to a proliferation of the glacial and periglacial landscapes that I've gone over in the past couple of episodes. Yeah. And Shropshire would have looked a lot more like Scafterfell or Skir... Yeah. Um, and Skirara so And Skirara so so Skirara... Skir, Skirara Sandura. It's Icelandic. <laughs> Skirara Sandur. Skirara Sandur in, so, in southern Iceland. Now what you've got in this kind of environment is the meltwater forming this large open plain ultimately leading to the sea. And in the case of Shropshire, this would have led to a series of glacial lakes, glacial meltwater rivers that were eventually led their way to the Severn and out to the, to the sea through that route. So if you're wondering what kind of impact the glaciers have on you today, it explains Shropshire's rolling landscape, particularly in the north. You've got these gentle rolling hills and fields, and a lot of this is because of the glacial tilt that's been deposited there. You've got a lot of wet sediments forming parts of the kettle holes. And one really significant thing is that the Ice Age diverted the River Severn. It used to flow northwards to the River Dee. It changed its course. It cut that trench, and it went to the Iron Bridge Gorge. When we cut the Iron Bridge Gorge, it exposed the raw materials that would allow the Industrial Revolution to take place in Shropshire. And in that sense, kind of led to the modern world as we know it.